I was asked by an esteemed and respected colleague to go over and explain the comprehensive annual financial report for his school district. And since all school districts are set up in basically the same structure and adhere to the same general government accounting principles by law, I hope that you who are watching can benefit by this information as well. First, we must understand what this whole district thing is. To put it simply, we are talking about what used to be called organized crime. What used to be called the mafia is now called the government. What used to be called the boss is now called the county mayor. The bookkeeper? Ah, he is now the county and state treasurer. The hideout is now simply a municipal corporation, uh, which is the proper name for counties, towns, boroughs, and cities. The lower turf bosses, each with their own boundaries or districts in which they conduct their own organized crime, are now the mayors of individual cities and townships, and they must give a certain percentage of their take to the county, to the state, and to the federal government. Instead of acting outside of or above the law, these organized criminals, mostly attorneys and financial opportunists, now write the laws which make their criminal activity perfectly legal. The Tommy gun has been replaced by the ballpoint pen. The thugs who used to come and collect protection money are now the municipal corporation police officers. No need to bury bodies in the desert anymore or to fit their victims with cement galoshes, for they can just legally take what property they desire and then assign you a life sentence in jail. Extortion has been renamed as taxation, and protection money has become known as property tax. These organized criminals have gone one step further, though, and created what is known as a district. Special districts, financing districts, special tax districts, special service districts, and, of course, school districts. As a state-created corporate entity, a special district is granted special financing authority by the boss of the state, the governor. In other words, it is granted the special authority to create new taxation, or protection money. Generally, the new tax created is called a property tax and can be designated for many, many different services, all offered at the barrel of a gun. The latest trick, though, is to create a fee for which all property owners and business owners must pay to continue to receive these forced services. Education, sewer, electric, lighting, street cleaning, water, power, cable, telephone, internet, parks and recreation, reclamation, fire, and police, and so many other taxation districts. These districts are stackable, meaning that you can actually live in 10, 20, or even 100 different taxation districts, from federal to state to local, meaning county and city, and have to pay a fee or tax for each service provided by each different district. While this would have surely caused a gang war before organized crime became legal, now it is simply a matter of collective, mutually beneficial taxation that is divided between gangs and their bosses, or mayors. If you, the people, do not or cannot pay these fees for all of these individual districts, the district boss then reports you to the county boss, who reports you to the state boss, who has the authority from the federal bosses to allow the bookkeeper, the state and county treasurer, to attach that fee to your property tax. And if you still refuse or aren't financially able to pay this protection money at the barrel of a gun, called property tax, then the organized crime bosses send in the police thugs, the police officers of the corporation, and take your property for payment of your fee. And for business owners, they take away your permission, your license, to do business in the county or state. Once a man puts on a uniform with a municipal badge, he becomes not a police man, but a police officer, 
representing the interests of and enforcing the city, county, state, and federal codes for which these governments falsely call law. For true law is only that granted by the consent of the governed, of you, the people. Jurisdiction is defined for purposes of law as the power, right, or authority to interpret, apply, and declare the law. This is a heavy responsibility. When considering the fact that police officers have jurisdiction in their prospective districts and municipalities, and when you take into consideration that the typical police officer is hired in their early 20s without the benefit of law school, or for that matter, little to no college education at all, this definition of jurisdiction becomes something of a frightening concept. The power, right, and authority to interpret apply, and declare the law. Now that you understand what a district is, and that no matter where you live, you will be forced to pay this property tax as a property owner within the school district, whether you have kids or not, let's take a look at the legal crime and hidden wealth that permeates each school district across the country. For this, we simply bring up the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR, the Full Audit of Government. A CAFR is the full and comprehensive historical accounting of the government. It is the real budget, which includes not only the current year's taxpayer assets and liabilities, but also, and very importantly, it includes the fund structure of government including many investments that the typical taxpayer has no idea even exist. Now, this particular school district is called the Rim of the World and is within the jurisdiction of San Bernardino County in the federally incorporated state of California. It is important to, first of all, understand that the annual budget report that is presented to the taxpayers for this school district is simply a carefully selected, smaller portion of the comprehensive or full report that is the CAFR. The budget report is what council members plan their yearly budgets around and how they decide to raise your taxes every year. Meanwhile, the CAFR remains hidden in plain sight. Very difficult to read for most normal people, and even for most accountants not in the know. In other words, the members of government and the lower positions of government offices have no idea how to read these CAFR reports either. Half don't even know they exist. This purposefully placed ignorance, though, definitely does not include the mayors or bosses of the corporate counties, and generally the city mayors as well. Thus, many of the investments, funds, and other organized legal criminal activity that exists within the district is never seen in the limited yearly and quarterly budget report that is selectively presented to the people and to many in the councils. And the people are, year after year, fooled into believing that their school district, as well as their city, county, and state government, is in poor financial shape, and that they need to pay more property taxes, more general taxes, more sales taxes, more state taxes, more county taxes, more city taxes, and more fees for their districts. Of course, this is not even close to being the truth. Without further ado, let's have a look at this small school district, one of 58 school districts in the state of California. While the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report is a requirement of federal law to be completed every fiscal year and posted for public view, it is not necessarily easy to find and next to impossible to read. I got lucky with this one as the council just happened to photocopy the report in its minutes, for its meeting of January of 2011. A Google search turned up a 2008 report as well. Here we see the board agenda item on January 20th, 2011, where the Rim of the World School District Board of Directors have approved the funding of the CAFR report, referred to here as the Audit Report. 
They have chosen the outside independent accounting and auditing firm of Vavernick, Trine, Day, and Company, a limited liability partnership corporation, to conduct this audit and complete the CAFR. And we see here that Education Code 41020 requires each school district to contract with a public accountant or certified public accountant to complete an audit of each district's financial records, ensuring compliance with federal and state accounting, reporting, and operating practices. And here we see the contract for that audit between Rim of the World School District and the Vavernick, Trine, Day and Company accounting firm. It simply states that this agreement made and entered into this first day of July 2008 between the governing board of the Rim of the World's Unified School District of San Bernardino County, State of California, hereafter referred to as the District, and Vavernick, Trine, Day, and Company, Limited Liability Partnership, Certified Public Accountants, hereafter referred to as the Auditors. Now I'm going to skip most of this contract, but you're certainly welcome to read it and I will leave the full versions up for that purpose. But well, we can see that this is a three-year contract beginning July 1st, 2008 and ending June 30th, 2011, which covers the 2010-2011 CAFR. On page 2, it talks about the audit fees. It states that our standard hourly rates vary according to the degree of responsibility involved and the experience level of the personnel assigned to your audit. You will be obligated to compensate us for all time expended and to reimburse us for all out-of-pocket costs through the date of termination. The fee listed below is based on anticipated cooperation from your personnel, the assumption that unexpected circumstances will not be encountered during the audit. No significant changes in reporting format and or audit requirements or significant changes in the operations of the district. So no matter what, the maximum annual fee for auditing services under the terms of this contract shall be $30,000 for the year ended June 30th, 2009, $30,000 for the year ending June 30th, 2010, and $32,000 for the year ending June 30th, 2011 for personal services with the exception that there might be additional auditing services. And you can read what those are here. Understanding, though, that there are over 230,000 individual governments within the United States, from state, city, county, local governments, districts, and everything else out there, and considering that $30,000 isn't very much compared to what most governments pay for these funds, we can see that just to pay for auditing all of these investments that government does is quite expensive to the taxpayer. That's you, by the way. And besides that $30,000, we can see the hourly charge that it takes to actually do these reports. Where we get into the $200 range for the year 2011, these guys are getting a raise of $7 or $8 each year, amazingly. But even for the paraprofessional, meaning a paralegal or a grunt, we're paying $74 an hour. That's a lot more money than some taxpayers get paid in a whole day. Oh, and of course, auditors shall be reimbursed for travel. And of course, the government then gives up its rights to take this company to court in case something happens by agreeing to something called arbitration, meaning that each party, the government and the accounting firm, is giving up the right to have the dispute decided in a court of law before a judge or jury, and instead are accepting the use of a arbitrator for the resolution of any problem. So the government's actually giving up its own right to use its own court system in the case that there's a problem with this auditing firm. Why? Why would you do that? Unless you're conducting legal crime, this wouldn't make sense. Now, it is important to understand that these auditors are not specifically there to offer an opinion on the way that this school district conducts its business, but rather to simply verify its accuracy in reporting according to federal and state codes, as well as to recommend ways to improve future accuracy in reporting. 
It is even more important to understand that these independent auditing companies are only allowed the privilege of auditing these CAFR reports as long as they are part of the organized criminal activity that they are auditing. In other words, they would not be in business as the bookkeepers and auditors of this legal government crime circuit, the legal mob, unless they keep the open secret of government funds to themselves. For, just as the government can take away your property and business license at any time it sees fit under its jurisdiction, when you don't pay your protection money, so too can government take away the incorporated limited liability status and revoke these auditing privileges from these cooperative accounting firms. And that is the real story behind this organized crime called government. It is a collective, uniformly and mutually beneficial organized corporate mob, with its gangsters in every facet of government contributing cooperatively to this cover-up. From media outlets to political campaigns, and everything in between. The players are either in on the game or compartmentalized enough to not know they are part of the game, something that is less commonly referred to as useful idiots or useful innocents, attributed to Soviet sympathizers during the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, propagandists for a government they do not understand. Compartmentalization can simply be defined as many individual people contributing from and benefiting from something, but never comprehending the full structure of what they work for. For instance, 1,000 different people can be working on 1,000 different mechanical parts of an unknown machine, but they are never told the purpose of their particular contribution and construction of their individual parts. But in the end, they've all unknowingly contributed and built the parts of a nuclear bomb. This is compartmentalization. And so, even as this board approves this audit report, only a few of them may actually understand the contents of that report. They only know it is a requirement of the corporation they work for, which is government. Reinforcing this concept is the resolution number 9-10-26, resolution for the Board of Trustees of the Rim of the World Unified School District regarding annual review, accounting, and adoption of school facilities fees pursuant to government codes and pursuant to the education codes. Now, if you don't understand the concept of the corporation and the fact that every government is, in fact, an incorporated entity, here it states that the Rim of the World Unified School District, the district, provides education for students in grades kindergarten through 12th grade within portions of unincorporated areas of San Bernardino County, which areas are located within the district's boundaries. This simply means that some cities are incorporated municipalities and some are unincorporated, but all of these areas that are unincorporated do lie within the incorporated county and the incorporated state. And the districts that are set up by the state and counties will always affect anyone no matter where they live in the state. In short, by being a citizen of the United States, you never live anywhere that is not considered government land. Government land that can be taken away from you at any time with either just compensation in eminent domain cases or with due process of law if you do not pay your district or property tax fees. And here it states that these government codes impart school districts the authority to levy and increase these fees, charges, or dedication upon residential and commercial industrial development projects for statutory school facility fees. This simply means that a property tax can be added to your house, to your property, or to the apartment building that you live in. And here it talks about some of the fees. We'll put up a few more pages that you can read later. And finally, in this minutes report, we come to the comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2010. 
This report will cover all government activities within this special district, this unified school district, from the date of July 1, 2009 through June 30, 2010. As much as I wish I had the current CAFR report, it is a good bet that these figures have increased and not decreased in the fiscal year of 2011. For that is the nature of government. It is a for-profit business masquerading as a non-profit. We can also see that this school district was incorporated on June 21st, 1954. So the figures that we're going to be covering in this CAFR are going to be the investments, savings, and assets from 1954 on, whereas the selected yearly budget report will only cover the previous and current year, taxation in and taxation out. Moving to the financial section on page 8, we see the independent auditor's report letter from the auditing firm Vavernick, Trine, Day and Company written to the governing board of the Rim of the World Unified School District. You will find a similar letter in all comprehensive annual financial reports because all governments are required to have an independent auditing firm conduct an audit on its financial statements. And here it states our responsibility is to express opinions on these financial statements based on our audit. We conducted our audit in accordance with the auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America, the standards applicable to the financial audits contained in government auditing standards issued by the Comptroller General of the United States, and standards and procedures for audits of California K-12 local educational agencies 2009-2010 through 2010, issued by the California Education Audit Appeals Panel as regulations. The letter goes on to state that this accounting firm is simply looking for instances of material misstatements, in other words, mistakes, and in just about every case, you're going to see that the accounting firm, because it's playing the government's game and wants that humongous fee that it's going to receive for preparing these statements, is going to say something like this. In our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material respects the respective financial position of the government activities, each major fund, and the aggregate remaining fund information of this particular school district. In other words, if this accounting and auditing firm wishes to continue to make all of this money off the backs of taxpayers, well, it's going to have to approve this audit. It then goes on to explain the overview of the financial statements. It explains the government-wide financial statements, and it explains the fund financial statements, government activities, fund financial statements, fiduciary activities, and a reconciliation of the fund financial statements to the government-wide financial statements, which we can call here just creative accounting, what you show the public versus what you actually have. And it states that the primary unit of government is the rim of the world unified school district. And so we now know that the members of the board of governors and the board of directors of the school district, the trustees of the corporation, absolutely and unequivocally understand, acknowledge, and pay for this comprehensive annual financial report or financial audit of their district and have this information available to them when they make budgetary decisions. With that in mind, let's dig deep into this comprehensive annual financial report and actually see what this district is hiding from the general comprehension of the people through publication of what they call their budget report every year. Of course, it always starts with the management's discussion and analysis where it states a little bit of bad news student enrollment continued to decline with a loss of 261 students over the prior year, which is a 5.5% decrease over the past year, and continuing at 95% of student enrollment. 
But then it states that despite this, the district was able to meet the minimum available reserve requirement of 3% of total expenditures. This simply means that by state statute and code, or law, the district is required to keep about 3% of its total expenditures, or future expenditures, on hand. The state does this through something called the fund structure, which we'll get to in a moment. And it states that the district continues to work and complete planned projects with Measure W monies. Now, as I understand it, this district is not being quite honest with what it's doing with these Measure W monies, and we'll get to that at the end of this presentation. Under reporting the district as a whole, in describing the Statement of Net Assets and Statements of Activities, it states that the Statement of Net Assets and the Statement of Activities report information about the district as a whole and about its activities. These statements include all assets and liabilities of the district using the accrual basis of accounting, which is similar to the accounting used by most private sector companies. Again, this is run very similar to a private corporation, and is a corporation. All of the current year's revenues and expenses are taken into account regardless of when cash is received or paid. Notice that it only mentions the current year's revenues and expenses. Even in this auditor's report, they attempt to hide money in the beginning of the report. These two statements report the district's net assets and changes in them. Net assets are the difference between assets and liabilities. One way to measure the district's financial health or financial position. Yes, just one way. Over time, increases or decreases in the district's net assets are one indicator of whether its financial health is improving or deteriorating. Other factors to consider are changes in the district's property tax base and the condition of the district's facilities. The relationship between revenues and expenses is the district's operating results. And the word operating is very important. Since the governing board's responsibility is to provide services to our students and not to generate profit as commercial entities do, one must consider other factors when evaluating the overall health of the district. The quality of the education and the safety of our schools will likely be an important component in this evaluation. Now, in a roundabout way, this statement is simply saying that this school district is involved in other things besides the operational responsibilities of the district. And that is where we get into the investments, or non-governmental activities, which we'll talk about now. In the Statement of Net Assets and the Statement of Activities, we report the district activities as follows. Under Governmental Activities, it states that the district reports all of its services in this category. And this is what gets reported on the budget report. This includes the education of kindergarten through grade 12 students, adult education services, the operation of child development activities, and the ongoing effort to improve and maintain buildings and sites. Property taxes, state income taxes, user fees, interest income, federal, state, and local grants finance these activities. Again, because of this tax status and the fact that these taxes and grants finance the governmental activities, this is what is reported to the taxpayer. Keep that in mind as we go along. And remember, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or Audit Report, covers non-governmental activities as well, which includes investments. On page 14, we see the district's most significant funds. And under the fund financial statements, it states, The fund financial statements provide detailed information about the most significant funds, not the district as a whole. Some funds are required to be established by state law. And again, this is reported to the taxpayer. However, management establishes many other funds to help it control and manage money, for particular purposes or to show that it is meeting legal responsibilities for using certain taxes, grants, and other money that it receives from the U.S. Department of Education. In other words, federal money. 
Under government funds, it states, most of the district's basic services are reported in governmental funds, as opposed to non-governmental funds, which focus on how money flows into and out of those funds and the balances left at year-end that are available for spending. These funds are reported using an accounting method called Modified Accrual Accounting, which measures cash and all other financial assets that can readily be converted to cash. These are liquid assets. The governmental fund statements provide a detailed short-term view of the district's general government operations and the basic services it provides. Governmental fund information helps determine whether there are more or fewer financial resources that can be spent in the near future to finance the district's programs. The differences between the governmental fund financial statements to those in the government-wide financial statements are explained in a reconciliation following each governmental fund financial statement. So again, it refers to the difference between government operational funds and everything else that the government holds. Funds that aren't reported in the budget report. And under reporting the district's fiduciary responsibilities, it states that the district is the trustee or fiduciary for funds held on behalf of others, like our funds for associated student body activities and scholarships. The district's fiduciary activities are reported in the statements of fiduciary net assets. We exclude these activities from the district's other financial statements because the district cannot use these assets to finance its operations. How very convenient. The district is responsible for ensuring that the assets reported in these funds are used for their intended purposes you're going to find that that's the general excuse for all funds, whether government or non-government. There was always some law or code that states that these funds must be designated for a certain project or purpose. Of course, laws are meant to be changed, and the very lawmakers who make the laws are the ones purporting that the laws are what require them to do things. And they will take that all the way to bankruptcy court insisting that their hands are tied because of law, the very law that they create. Now we get into the good stuff, and this is going to shock you. Under the district as a whole, and under the net assets, it states that for the 2009-2010 fiscal year, the district's net assets were $61.7 million as of June 30th, 2010, as compared to $64.3 million at June 30th, 2009. So here in this first statement, the government actually tells you that it somehow lost almost $3 million. This, again, is called creative accounting, and we'll discuss that as we go. As of June 30th, 2010, $4,207,106 was unrestricted, meaning that technically it could be spent on anything they want to spend it on because it is unrestricted. Restricted net assets are reported separately to show legal constraints from debt covenants and enabling legislation that limit the school board's ability to use those net assets for day-to-day -day operations. Thus, we have a difference between restricted and unrestricted assets. Our analysis below focuses on the net assets, Table 1, and change in net assets, Table 2, of the district's governmental activities. Now, under Table 1, it shows that for 2010, Capital assets equal $55,791,000. When we refer to a capital asset, we refer to buildings, construction equipment, and other objects and real estate that are not what we call liquid assets. Things that can be sold immediately for cash. It also lists, under current and other assets, $20,222,000, which are, in fact, liquid assets, cash, and investments. We then move to the liabilities section where it states current liabilities of $4.8 million and long-term obligations of $9.4 million. 
Now this is very important to make the distinction between current liabilities and long-term liabilities. By reporting $9.4 million as a long-term liability, this district is actually hiding that $9.4 million. An easy way to understand this would be if you were to report your future car payments on your current checking account balance. So if your balance today is $10,000 and for next year you're going to pay $1,000 a month for your car payment, you could actually show, despite the fact that you have $10,000 cash in the bank today, that you have negative $2,000 because of your long-term obligations. This is how government hides its money. By reporting obligations without reporting the future or long-term assets that will actually cover the bills for those obligations. And under net assets, we see the capital restricted and unrestricted assets for a total of 61 million. But the next paragraph is what I want you to pay particular attention to, because this paragraph of all the paragraphs in this comprehensive annual financial report is the most important thing you will read. It states, the $4,207,106 in unrestricted net assets of governmental activities, which is an increase of $372,278 over the prior year, represents the accumulated results of all past year's operations. And here's where it gets interesting. It means that if we had to pay off all of our bills today and get the district completely out of debt, including all of our non-capital liabilities, meaning other investments and debt that don't have to do with the school, its buildings, its property, and its structures or vehicles, we would still have $61,669,861 in assets remaining. So after all bills are paid off, this district claims that it would still have over $61 million in assets. And because it lists its capital assets, its buildings, vehicles, etc., at only $55 million, those extra assets are all liquid assets. So again, the school district, if it chose to, if California law and federal law would allow it to, it could pay off all of its bills today, be completely out of debt, and still have $61 million worth of assets. This is a typical government report. There are no bankrupt cities. There are no bankrupt districts. All of these governments, all 230,000 around the country, all report the same findings. I have yet to find a report that shows a government is actually in debt or in the red. Now, after all that, it then states one of the most illogical things you'll ever hear. It states that, we will continue to closely monitor our revenues and expenditures in the future in order to increase this $4.2 million unrestricted balance. Now, but wait a minute. If I have a couple million dollars in outstanding debt that I have to pay interest upon, why wouldn't I use like you'd expect a government to do, why wouldn't I use my $4 million to pay off my $2 million of debt? Ah, understanding that is understanding the whole concept of what government does with your taxpayer money. This is the organized crime we referred to in the beginning because it's much more profitable to invest that $4 million than use it to pay off the public debt. And under the changes in net assets, again, it lists governmental activities, not including all of the non-governmental activities. And as you can see, the change in total net assets here is reported at negative $2.5 million. Now, didn't we just read that if the school district paid off all of its debt, it would still have over $61 million in assets? 
And yet here, to confuse the heck out of people, it states that in fiscal year 2010, the district is in the red by $2.59 million. This, again, is typical government creative financing. Reporting governmental activities while keeping non-governmental activities a secret from the taxpayer. Now, as mentioned earlier, we come to the place where most of this money is being hidden from the people. These are some of the district's funds that it contributes taxpayer money to. It states that the general fund revenues were $6,141,000 less than projected at the time the budget was adopted in June 2009, and expenditures were $827,918 less than originally projected. Now again, this is a creative way of saying that the school district charged too much money. $833,000 too much. Now, you'd think that the district would say, oops, we're sorry to the taxpayers, and refund that money. Ah, but this isn't how government works. Government invests that money instead and makes profit from that money. And through the creative accounting and reporting we've seen so far, it hides that money by reporting that it has future liabilities. The majority of the revenue increases occurred in state and federal categorical programs, while expenditure decreases were related to spending limits due to the flexibility of categorical funds and a combined effort from all departments and groups to cut costs. Now under Table 4 we see some of the actual funds that government invests this money into. Most people know about the general fund. The general fund is reported on the taxpayer budget. But did you know about the adult education fund, the child development fund, the cafeteria fund, the deferred maintenance fund, the building fund, the capital facilities fund, the county school facilities fund, special reverse fund for capital outlay projects, bond interest and redemption funds, and the tax override fund? Huh. Well, isn't that interesting? That's a whole lot of funds. And we see that the combined balance of those funds in liquid assets that could technically be spent on anything at the end of fiscal year, June 30th, 2010, we show over 15 million extra dollars in liquid assets, for which they show as a decrease of 1.19 million from the previous year meaning that that money was transferred somewhere else and not replaced in these particular funds. And this, of course, is where we get into the legal codes and laws that are set into place to ensure that these funds are not used for other debt purposes. In other words, by restricting these funds to specifically go towards certain liabilities and projects, this school district is able to hide those funds from public knowledge and is able to report each year in its budget statement to the taxpayer that it needs to raise taxes. Under capital assets, it states that at June 30th, 2010, the district had 55.8 million in capital assets, including land, buildings, and furniture and equipment. This amount represents a net decrease, including additions, deductions, and depreciation of $827,000, or 1.5%, from last year. The year's reduction of $827,000 was caused by increased depreciation on district buildings. So here we see another way of actually hiding wealth. By simply creating depreciation in the marketplace, this school district was able to take off $827,000 worth of value, even though nothing really changed. The concept of inflation and deflation is a creation of your government, and it is very much used for this purpose, to either decrease or increase the value of real estate and other capital assets so that it may make a profit off of that decrease or increase. Remember that someone's loss is always someone else's gain. This is a very important rule, for there are always two sides to every trade. Someone is always making money. 
And again here we see the long-term obligations listed, where it states at the end of this year the district had 9.4 million in long-term obligations. The general obligation bond portion of this amount is 8.1 million. The remaining 1.3 million represents compensated absences, retirement incentives, and other post-employment benefits, OPEB. The primary component of the increase is the inclusion of OPEB not included in the prior year notes. We present more detailed information regarding our long-term obligations in Note 8 of the financial statements. Other lease obligations, primarily for copiers and vehicles, are not included in this item because they are funded from the current operating budget. Now it's important to note under Table 6 what general obligation bonds are. Here, it lists them as general obligation bonds, but in parentheses it states that they are financed with property taxes. What that really means is that these loans, or bonds, are collateralized with your property. When it states that these loans, or bonds, are financed with property taxes, that puts the requirement on government to collect property taxes, and if it cannot collect the property taxes, it will go into default, having to create more bonds, or loans, to repay the old obligation bonds, and in the process raising your property taxes even more. When this states that these bonds are financed with property taxes, the truth of the matter is that they are financed and backed with your property. For if you don't pay your property taxes, this government will take your property. And this is very important to understand. If you wish to know how powerful this cabal, this legal mob, is, then don't pay your property taxes and see what happens. Also important to note is the retirement incentive of $498,000 for 2010. Now, one has to ask why you would offer a retirement incentive for a government employee. Why would you offer early retirement and pay all kinds of money in the millions and millions of dollars for people to retire early and then charge that retirement income to the taxpayer. Why taxpayers allow this is really a question I can't answer. Why do you allow it? Also important to note here is that under significant accomplishments of fiscal year 2009 and 10, it states that the district was successful in its continued efforts to sustain the average daily attendance as a percentage of pupil enrollment even as the enrollment decline continues. The average daily attendance figure is a very important percentage to school districts. For, as we see on the next page, in considering the district budget for the 2010 and 11 year, the governing board and management used the following criteria. Number six states unrestricted lottery is projected at $112.50 per ADA, and restricted lottery is projected at $17.50 per ADA. So for every student that attends, this school district receives that amount of money per average daily attendance. Now, before we go on with the comprehensive annual financial report for the Rim of the World School District, let's take a look at how the California lottery actually works. For what we find is that the lottery is one of the biggest Ponzi schemes you'll ever encounter. So let's have a look at the California State Lottery. Now, because the California Lottery is itself a separate incorporated entity of the state of California, it, like all government corporations, must also file a comprehensive annual financial report. And here it is. This for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2009, where the lottery states that it is committed to enhancing education and supporting local communities. Well, let's just see if that statement is actually true. It also states that California Lottery is an enterprise fund of the state of California. Remember that the word enterprise 
is simply defined as a company organized for commercial purposes or a business firm. Government is full of enterprises, including such things as golf courses, sewer, light, and power districts, and other such business activities. These are essentially for-profit corporations that are listed as non-profits. So let's take a look at how this government enterprise actually works. Here it states on December 31st, 2009, that the California State Lottery is pleased to provide this comprehensive annual financial report, or CAFR, for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2009. The Finance Division of the Lottery prepared this CAFR to present an overview of the California State Lottery. The CAFR includes the lottery's annual financial statements presented in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America and audited in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America. Once again, most CAFRs look exactly the same. The CAFR covers the financial activity of the lottery, a single enterprise fund. The report follows formal standards of the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada, or GFOA. Government organizations that publish this type of report can be compared to each other because similar types of information are included in the report you will find that the entire world is on the comprehensive annual financial reporting system in one way or the other. It states that all disclosures necessary to gain an understanding of the lottery's financial activities have been included in this report. And again, we see that California statutes require an annual financial audit by an independent certified public accountant, or CPA. The Independent Auditor's Report on the Lottery's Financial Statements is included in the financial section of this report. Now, it's always important to note that these Ponzi schemes, these organized criminal activities by government, are generally set up with the public's consent. And because the public elects representatives, that consent is generally presumed meaning that the true opinion of the public is not necessarily taken into consideration by the representatives who use that implied consent. Here it states that the lottery was created by a 1984 ballot initiative that was approved by 58% of the voters. Of course, we have to take into consideration that since barely 50% of the people even vote in the first place, there is no way that 58% of the population of California eligible to vote could have approved this, meaning that no way did half of the voting population approve the lottery in the first place, because over half of them didn't vote. The lottery was established as an independent state agency to market and sell lottery products to the California public. By law, the lottery is required to return, as nearly as practical, 50% of revenues to the public in the form of prizes, at least 34% to public education, and allocate no more than 16% for administrative costs. The Lottery Act specifies that the lottery is operated and administered by a five-member commission appointed by the governor. A director who is appointed by the governor serves as the chief administrator of the lottery. The legislature has the authority to amend the Lottery Act by a two-thirds majority if by doing so it furthers the purposes of the measure. In other words, all that's needed is to get the act or the law on the books. At that point, your so-called representative government can then amend that act in any way it sees fit. It can change it at any time. It can make it whatever it wishes. All government cares about is getting a law on the books, at which point it can change that law in any way it sees fit in future legislative actions. It then goes on to explain how many of the games work, how they were created, and the amount of money that's generated from each game. And for those living in other states who have similar programs, whether it be lottery, alcohol, or any other state enterprise, where the state is the only one that can sell these products, this is basically how it all works. 
It states that from its inception in 1985 through June 30th, 2009, the lottery has generated approximately $59.3 billion in sales and contributed nearly $21.8 billion to schools. This is a very deceiving statement, as we'll see in a moment. The retailers who sell lottery tickets have received almost $3.9 billion in compensation. Of course, we have to remember that that is taxpayer money. Approximately $30.5 billion has been won by lucky lottery winners. Congratulations, folks. Now let's talk about the scam that you're involved in. Additionally, by saving money on operations, the lottery has given more money to schools than the required 34% of sales revenues. Again, a very, very deceiving statement. Since October 1985, the lottery has contributed an additional $557 million to education through operational savings. Now note that they say the word education and not schools. And this is a very important distinction. Here's why. Under accounting system and policies, it states that the lottery operates the California State Lottery Fund, an enterprise operation fund that, like a private business, utilizes the full accrual basis of accounting in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. Again, this is uniform across America and indeed across the world. It then states that a comprehensive annual budget is prepared in conjunction with the lottery's annual business plan. The budget is prepared on both a cash basis and a full accrual basis of accounting. The budget is based on sales forecasts, industry trends, program proposals, and approved action plans. Again, we're talking about the budget, not the comprehensive annual financial report, as we're about to see here. By using future liabilities and other creative accounting methods, the budget report, as opposed to the CAFR, will show just normal operations without showing what we're about to look at now. Under debt administration, it states that the lottery's long-term liabilities include payments owed to winners of lotto jackpots and various scratcher games with annuity prizes. The payments due to winners are funded by amounts invested in zero-coupon U.S. Treasury bonds. Since its inception, the lottery has purchased U.S. Treasury bonds to provide funds for long-term annuity payments to prize winners. However, changes in the financial markets created an opportunity to replace the lottery's U.S. Treasury bonds with higher-yielding, high-credit, quality instruments that would result in a net increase in proceeds for the lottery. In 2009, with commission approval, the lottery undertook steps to restructure a portment of its investment portfolio with the goal of reducing the cost of investments for long-term annuity prize payments and increasing resources to drive higher sales of lottery products. So what does this mean exactly? Well, let's say that you're a church and you hold a raffle contest. The way that it should work quite simply, is that you collect a dollar for each raffle ticket sold, and at the end of the day, you simply divide that money into profit and loss. If you collect $100 in raffle tickets, and you give away half of that money, you're simply giving away $50, and you're keeping $50 for yourself. Now, of course, that would be the logical and reasonable way for this California State Lottery to operate, having no future debt or obligations of any kind. It should simply be paying that 50% of its income to winners, the required 36% to schools, and I guess technically it needs that 16% to make the whole thing work. But again, that's not how government operates. Let's take a look at what the lottery fund actually does. Under cash management, it states that the cash due from its retailers is collected on a weekly basis through an electric funds transfer system and deposited into an account within the California State Treasurer's Office. Idle cash, as people are starving, is invested in the Surplus Money Investment Fund, a commingled fund of the state of California, and interest earnings are received quarterly. The fund is administered by the Pooled Money Investment Board, 
which is composed of the state treasurer, the state controller, and the director of the Department of Finance. Now, for more information on this, please see my video entitled Kaffir School, What is a Commingled Fund? Under risk management, it states the lottery has elected, with a few exceptions, to be self-insured against loss or liability. This simply means that the lottery has invested a lot of this taxpayer money into a separate fund called a risk management fund. It then pays out of that fund, through the assets and annuities of that fund, any future lawsuits or injury claims by employees or taxpayers. Under major initiatives, it states that the California State Lottery took big steps toward improving its brand image during the fiscal year 2009 by offering exciting new products and promotions and by expanding its vast network of multimedia video monitors that provide players with the latest information about lottery products. The lottery also initiated efforts to closely examine its practices and develop a roadmap for future success by starting the process of writing a new business plan. <laughs> Let's face it, folks. What this says is that your government relies on gambling to fund schools. Understand this, please. Government is promoting and making legal its own gambling scheme in order to fund its investment portfolio. Let's move on. As part of its effort to create more winners and encourage players to recycle their tickets, the lottery launched the California Lottery's Replay Program that gives customers a second chance to win cash and prizes by going to the California Lottery's website. Now, again, to create more winners, you have to create more players. And so, again, the government is promoting gambling as a way to fund its spending. In fiscal year 2009, the lottery also struck a unique partnership with the California Peace Officers Memorial Foundation, another fund, on a special scratchers ticket that helped raise $300,000 for the foundation, which supposedly provides assistance and scholarships to the families of slain peace officers throughout the state. These peace officers, of course, being the ones who come and take your home if you don't pay their fees. Now, all of these foundations are set up very similarly to what we're talking about here. In other words, the money goes into a fund and not necessarily to the families of the peace officers themselves. At least, not right away. Even more insulting, it talks about the local economy. It states that two years into the housing slump, the national and California economies began to face additional headwinds. Falling home prices, tight credit conditions, dysfunctional financial markets, and soaring food and energy prices. All of these things are essentially enterprise operations of government, from the credit markets and stock market itself, to the companies that manufacture food, to the enterprise operations that create the energy prices. Government regulates those prices. These headwinds took a toll. The housing downturn worsened, labor markets weakened, and at the end of 2007, consumers began to lose confidence in the economy. The struggling housing sector will continue to weigh on the state and national economies. And so again, instead of government focusing its efforts to correct these problems, instead, it promotes its lottery its legalized gambling scheme that allows this California enterprise fund to be created and all of that money to be invested. Now, in my opinion, that is not why we're supposed to have government. And that is certainly not what they're supposed to be doing with our taxpayer money. Moving on to the financial section, we see again the independent auditor's report where this government had to go by federal and state law to a private accounting firm to get the audit of this CAFR. Comically, it states, as discussed in Note 1, the financial statements present only the California State Lottery Fund and do not purport to and do not present fairly the financial position of the state of California. 
And here it states a summary of total revenues for the fiscal years ended June 30th, 2008 and June 30th, 2009 where we see the state of California is bringing in approximately $3 billion each year in revenues. Also listed here are non-operating revenues, in other words, non-governmental functions, where we see unrealized gains and losses on investments, interest on funds held by the state treasurer, and other income. Again, government operating outside of its bounds which is allowed to happen by state law. When we look at the expenses chart, it states that the following chart shows prizes, game costs, operating expenses, and allocations as a percentage of operating revenues for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2009. We see here that prizes represent 52.4% of the total money paid. We see retailer costs, game costs, and operating expenses, and then we see the allocation of operating income and investment proceeds to the education fund. Wait a minute. What does that mean? Oh, I get it. It means that the lottery itself, when it states that it gives money to education, is actually giving that money to the education fund. There's a big difference between those two. That money is not going to schools, it is going to an education fund. Oh, now we start to see the bigger picture here. And so again we see the creative accounting that makes government so grand. This, again, is organized crime. Legal criminal activity. And the marketing of that activity is the most important part, because as the enterprise fund known as the California Lottery tells the taxpayers that it's giving 34 or 36 percent of its profits to schools, the truth of the matter is that it is simply depositing that money into another enterprise fund called the Education Fund. There's a big difference between giving money to a school and giving money to a fund. So let's examine this a little further. When I go to the Super Lotto page of the California Lottery, we begin to understand how this scheme works. Under Payment Options, it states that by default, all Super Lotto Plus jackpots are paid in 26 annual installments. A winner has the opportunity to choose the cash value of their jackpot prize within 60 days of the lottery's payment approval date. The payment option chosen will apply to all claimants in a multiple ownership claim. Either way, government is going to make a killing from your choice. If you select the cash option, you will receive an amount equal to the net proceeds of the sale of bonds purchased to fund the 26 annual payments for that prize. This will be a single lump sum payment and is estimated at 45% to 55% of the jackpot amount. Huh. Well, gee, what happens to the rest of that money? Well, that's called taxation. That is revenue for government. So immediately, 50% of that money is taken out in federal and state taxes. The other 50% goes to the winner. But you'll notice here that it says you will receive an amount equal to the net proceeds of the sale of bonds. And of course, if you choose the annual payments option, you will receive the Super Lotto Plus jackpot and 26 graduated annual payments. So they're going to wait 26 whole years before they have to finally pay off the amount that they owe to you. Well, what do you think they do with that money in the interim? For instance, here's a $7 million jackpot that is paid over 26 years. The last payment is $357,000, which is the largest payment of that prize. But what is government actually doing with that $357,000 that is not due to be paid for 26 whole years? Well, it invests that money. Why else in God's name would government want to extend payments out through 26 years 
unless it wished to create a profit by investing that money and not being obligated for it for 26 years, 25 years, 24 years. By the time 26 years comes around, that $357,000, which the lottery collected in order to pay that prize today, will earn government an untold, unimaginable investment return. This is the Ponzi scheme of the lottery. The money is being invested in a big, big way. That money that's earned off of those investments does not go to schools. That is play money. That is the money that goes towards the incorporation and takeover of the entire global structure. It funds wars. It funds all the things that you wonder how they get funded. You must multiply this scheme that we're seeing right here over vast amounts of governments across the country, from lotteries to alcohol to anything else that the state county or city controls the districts the school districts they're all participating in this type of commingled fund there are laws that require each and every city county and district to contribute to the state treasurer's fund it is for the sole purpose of investment and nothing else the benefit that is paid to the schools is just a side effect it is not the reason that this lottery fund has been set up. Not in the least. The purpose of the lottery is to create new money and invest it. So you can see why it's in the federal government's best interest to have legalized gambling through a lottery. Every single winner is going to give 25 to 30 percent of their winnings to the federal government. On this $7 million jackpot, the federal government is automatically going to get over a million dollars for doing absolutely nothing. And the state treasurer is going to benefit as well by being allowed by federal government statutes to invest that money in federal securities. This Euroboros snake eating its own tail, this is your government. It is a cooperative effort on behalf of all state, local, and federal agencies. The states are allowed to do certain things because it benefits financially the federal government. Likewise, the county and cities are forced by law to invest in state treasurer funds because it benefits the state, which in turn benefits the federal government. It then goes on to talk about some of its debt, like the increase in gaming equipment costs, and the funding of a new television show, a government-sponsored television show for the lottery. Wonderful. I can imagine kids watching that and just waiting until they're old enough to start gambling. Thanks, government. The most important part about this, though, is the long-term debt that's created by every winner of the California State Lottery. At June 30th, 2009, the California State Lottery had $1.1 billion in outstanding long-term liability versus $1.2 billion last year, a decrease of 11.3%. Most of the change is attributable to lotto game prize liability, as the majority of jackpot winners now choose the cash option rather than the annuitized payments. In addition, $4.6 was accrued for the net OPEB obligation, as required by Statement Number 45 of the Government Accounting Standards Board, bringing the total accrued OPEB liability to $9.7 million at the end of June 30th, 2009. So $9.7 million of that taxpayer money goes to fund pension fund schemes as well as other employment benefits, which are also the same kind of investment funds. So a major portion of that 16% that goes to fund the operations of the lottery actually just goes into the pension fund system, the largest Ponzi scheme in the world. For more on pension funds, and why they're not what you think they are, you can watch my movie, The Great Pension Fund Hoax, linked below. Now, if you want to complain about this, or maybe occupy what you should be occupying, here's the address for the California State Lottery Finance Department. 
in Sacramento, California. Here we see the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net assets, where it lists its assets and liabilities. Notice that under salaries, wages, and benefits, $49 million is spent just to pay the employees of the lottery. This is a massive enterprise operation. And so the income before operating expenses equals $1.1 billion for legalized crime. But that's for operating expenses. What about the non-governmental or non-operating expense revenues? Well, for the funds investments, under Note 9, we have $6.7 million in profit. Other income at $408,000. And then there's the allocation to the education fund. Another look at where the money goes. It doesn't go to schools. It goes to the education fund. Big difference. And at the end of the year, it shows total net assets at $147 million. And through this creative accounting, it can show a loss for that year of $18 million. And again, here's the distributions to the education fund at over a billion dollars, followed by its cash flows from investments, where it shows proceeds from disposal of capital assets at $104,000, purchase of securities at $677 million, Proceeds from matured securities at $283 million. Proceeds from the sale of purchased securities at $659 million. Surplus money investment fund interest, where the lottery fund itself, not the education fund, but the lottery fund holds all of this taxpayer money, with interest of $10 million for total net cash flows of over $275 million from non-governmental operations, investments of the lottery. This is craziness. This is how government works. Your view when you walk into the DMV or walk into just about every government office is only the tip of the iceberg. Underneath is the massive investment corporation that we're talking about here. You think that these government workers are idiots, and it works, because while you think they're idiots, while you call the presidents of the United States complete nincompoops, they are getting away with massive organized crime with your consent and without you even knowing that it's happening. And for the California State Lottery Fund, notes to financial statements, it goes over the organization of the lottery fund, where it states that the lottery is part of the primary government of the state of California and is reported as a proprietary fund and business type activity within the state of California's financial statements the CAFR of the state of California. The purpose of the act is to support the preservation of the rights, liberties, and welfare of the people. <laughs> Let me read that again. The purpose of the act, the purpose of creating the lottery, are we getting this? The purpose of creating the lottery act is to support the preservation of the rights, liberties, and welfare of the people by providing additional monies to benefit education without the imposition of additional or increased taxes. <laughs> Again, supporting legalized crime getting the poorest of the poor to buy lottery tickets instead of food or instead of saving that money for themselves is what government calls the preservation of rights, liberties, and welfare of the people. You have to forgive me for disagreeing with this statement. And I don't think any rational person watching this would disagree with me. The operations of the lottery are separate and distinct from other operations of the state of California. In other words, it is an incorporated entity that acts outside of the state of California, but gives all of its money to the state of California through the education fund. And again, it states that 50% of the total annual revenues from lottery sales are returned to the public in the form of prizes, and at least 34% should be allocated to benefit public education. The lottery is accounted for as an enterprise fund. The financial statements are prepared on the accrual basis of accounting. 
Further down, it states that all Super Lotto Plus prizes won but not claimed within the specified period are allocated directly to the education fund. Huh. So in other words, any money that goes unclaimed just goes to the education fund, to the state commingled fund. And that's a very important key to the puzzle too. Now, of course, unclaimed prizes you'd think would be only just a few thousand here, maybe. Someone lost a lottery ticket. Now, I don't know about you folks, but when I participate in some form of gambling, it triggers the addictive response that triggers in most people's brains and all you can think about is whether you're going to win a million dollars or not. When you buy a scratcher ticket and you win that prize, you put it in your pocket and you can't wait to get to the store even if it's just a five dollar winner. So the thought would be that maybe there's a couple thousand, maybe even close to a million dollars, I guess, in unclaimed prizes. But that's not how it works, you see. <laughs> We see that all Fantasy V prizes, won but not claimed within the specified period, are allocated directly to the Education Fund. All Daily Three prizes also go to the Education Fund that aren't claimed. All Unclaimed Daily Four prizes won. All Daily Derby prizes, all Hotspot prizes that are won, just about everything. And then we see that under the Supplemental Disclosure of Non-Cash Activities, we see unclaimed prizes for the California lottery in total that are directly allocated to the education fund at $20,964,857. You're telling me that in 2009, almost $21 million went unclaimed? Whoever's watching this right now, if you can believe that, <laughs> then you, you have a tolerance for lies that I certainly don't have. And, of course, further down in the report, we see the contributions to education. In other words, contributions to the education fund, where we see a list of these unclaimed prizes. In 2000, it was $40 million. In 2001, $79 million. In 2002, 36 million. 2003, 42 million. 2004, 50 million. 2005, 27 million. 2006, 29 million. 2007, 29 million. 2008, 25 million. And in 2009, only 20 million. That is an amazing amount of money to go unclaimed every year. That is multiple jackpot prizes. This, I assure you, is not happening by accident. There is something going on here that is creating these unclaimed prizes. None dare call it conspiracy. And we also see the allocations to the education fund for 2000 through 2009, always around $1 billion. So every year, the state of California is getting a billion dollars put into the education fund. It is then investing that money and paying some of it to schools. And continuing in the notes to financial statements, we see a few things that you might want to read for yourself. But take note here that the advertising expenses totaled $42,184,700 for the year ended June 30th, 2009. Now, I can't help but think here that that's $42 million that could have went to schools instead of to support a gambling addiction for the people of the state of California. Call me crazy here, but this doesn't seem like government as much as a organized mob. What used to be undercover, hidden black market casinos run by the mob have now just turned into legalized lottery gambling. Is this really what government is supposed to be doing? I don't think so. It goes on to talk about its investment earnings, and it states that generally all cash is held on deposit with the California State Treasurer in these commingled funds and is invested by that office in the Surplus Money Investment Fund. Once again, the link below on this YouTube video will link to another Kaffir School video called What is a Commingled Fund? 
I highly recommend viewing that as it talks about the $64 billion that California holds in that state treasurer's investment fund. And it states that interest on funds held by the state treasurer is distributed quarterly. And we saw earlier in the report where the lottery fund listed the millions it received in interest payments. Now again, the original Lottery Act was amended on January 28, 2009, when the Lottery Commission approved an amendment to the lottery's investment policy that allowed for the restructuring of its investment portfolio to maximize the investment return. Prior to this, the lottery's policy limited investments to the U.S. Treasury Zero Coupon Bonds. The new amendment authorizes the lottery to sell its previously held U.S. Treasury Zero Coupon Bonds and replace them with municipal and agency bonds, as well as with other U.S. Treasuries. The lottery began restructuring its investment portfolio on May 2009. By replacing U.S. Treasury zero coupon bonds with higher yielding investments, the lottery is able to generate cash proceeds that can be used to further the lottery's directives. Its directives to invest the money and make more money. Wonderful. And remember what a municipal bond is, folks. That just means they're putting up your property and public property within the municipality, malls, movie theaters, everything else, and they're putting a first lien position on that property. And if the municipality, or you, as the taxpayer who supports that municipality, defaults on the debt, well, guess what? There's a lien on that municipal property, that collective citizen property, and that property will be used to pay for the debt. It is collateralized by your property, your collective municipal property. All of this happens all of the time without your comprehension, without your knowledge, and with your implied consent. As of June 30th, 2009, the lottery's investments, with yields ranging from 0.11% to 5.78%, consist of the following. Total investments at fair value of about $1.5 billion. Most of them federal treasury and agency holdings. And keep in mind, the federal government doesn't necessarily invest in the United States, but invests that money in creating new foreign markets. It builds up corporations in China, Indonesia, and other third world countries, and then allows those companies, which are mostly American companies, to import their products here, devoid of any rules or regulations regarding pollution or any other protective laws. It's really quite a brilliant scheme when you think about it, and you gotta give them credit. For they are much more brilliant than you could have ever imagined, and they've been doing this under your nose for many, many decades. Under the Deposits and Investments section, we see that the state treasury through the Surplus Money Investment Fund is holding $275 million of lottery money, and it states that by law, these monies can only be invested in the following categories. U.S. government securities, securities of federally sponsored agencies, domestic corporate bonds, interest-bearing time deposits in California banks, savings and loan associations and credit unions, prime-rated commercial paper, repurchase and reverse repurchase agreements, security loans, bankers' acceptances, negotiable certificates of deposit, and loans to various bond funds, the government borrowing from itself. 
So basically, your California government is investing in banks. It's investing your taxpayer money in banks, in government securities, and federal securities, which then go to invest in the whole international scheme of corporatism. Congratulations again, all of this under your nose for all of these years. And finally, we see U.S. lottery data for fiscal year 2009 which actually excludes some of the video lottery sales. Here, listed by state, we see the sales, the prizes, and most importantly, the profit that's made from the lottery. Now, remember that when they list these numbers, they're listing them in millions of dollars, which means that you have to add six zeros to all of these figures. And so the profit in California was 1 billion, not 1,000. Arizona, 129 million. Colorado, 119 million. Some of the bigger ones, like Florida, made 1.2 billion, surpassing California's profits. Massachusetts with $858 million. Michigan with $727 million. New Jersey, $849 million. New York State with $2.5 billion in profit, in investment profit from the lottery. Ohio with $702 million. Pennsylvania, $910 million. Texas, a little over $1 billion. And we can see that only five or six of the 50 states are not involved in this scheme. And one of those is the District of Columbia, which is not even a state of the Union. But the corporation itself, the federal corporation, known as Washington, D.C., the United States Incorporated. And one last little snippet here. It states that the California State Lottery measures much of its success by the amount of money it contributes to California schools and colleges. Very important. Colleges are enterprise operations as well, which is why college rates are so high. That is profit for government. In fiscal year 2008 and 2009, the lottery provided approximately $1.4 billion to education. Since its inception in 1985, the lottery has contributed more than $21.8 billion to California schools out of total sales and investment proceeds of more than $59.27 billion. So almost $40 billion that did not go to schools. The current downturn in the economy has presented the lottery with a special challenge as it tries to maintain sales. Because that's what's important in a downtrodden economy, is to ensure that lottery sales remain high. Well, thank you, government. It's good to know that you've got priorities. And at the bottom, it states that in addition to economic conditions, lottery sales are hampered by restrictions that limit our ability to pay out bigger prizes. Based on our own experiences and those of other lotteries, we believe that we would be able to increase sales and our contribution to schools by removing prize restrictions. We're asking lawmakers to provide the lottery with the authority to pay out more money in prizes to our customers so we can increase sales and generate even larger contributions to California schools and colleges. <laughs> there is so much wrong with this statement. First and foremost being that gambling is not a solution to government. It is not a solution to debt. It is not a solution to anything. And of course, when they say we are asking lawmakers to provide the lottery with the authority to pay out more money in prizes, that means that they are changing the original law that was voted on by taxpayers for which they justify this gambling in the first place. So when you create new laws, government then goes in and changes those laws to benefit its investment portfolio. So there you have it. The lottery scheme explained. Again, remember the church model. Remember the simple raffle ticket concept. And now compare that concept to what the lottery has explained here in its comprehensive annual financial report. 
Now, going back to the Rim of the World School District Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, we see that expenditures are based on the following forecasts. Utilities are based on current year usage plus a projected 5% increase. Now, why have I outlined that? That seems perfectly normal, doesn't it? Well, yes, until you realize that generally utility companies are government enterprise operations. They are part of government. If they are independent, they are often owned by government investments through the pension and other trust and investment funds. Many governments either start out or end up buying their utility companies, turning these companies into government enterprise operations that are certainly for profit. So in the traditional sense of government, the thought of the utility company being a government agency charging even more money for their services doesn't really make sense. But when we add the profit model to government, government acting in non-governmental enterprise activities, we start to understand that government creates this price increase simply to make profit. The highest level of governments, from the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve, create a false market of inflation and deflation, which also helps to increase the price of these utilities. Again, these are for-profit businesses generally owned by the very government that is allowing the price increase. Government regulates its own corporations and, of course, charges the taxpayer for those services. Down here at the bottom, it tells you how you can contact the district's financial management offices, and it gives the email for Jenny and Connie at the bottom. Why don't you send them a nice little email and tell them that you're on to their game. You know that according to their comprehensive annual financial report, if they paid off all their bills, they'd still have over $60 million worth of assets. Huh. I wonder what they'd think and how they'd respond to an email like that, or if they even know that this is the case. Here's another look at the assets and liabilities. And again, it's important to note here that under the liabilities section, we see listed the current portion of long-term obligations. That's the payments that are due now within the next very short period of time listed at $728,000. But directly under that is listed the non-current portion of long-term obligations. Listed at $8.7 million, these are payments for future debt that have nothing to do with the balance of net assets today. In other words, they're taking $8.7 million off of the total listed assets and showing less money than they actually have. And when we look at net assets, we also see the debt service fund, which shows $663,968, again, reserved to pay future debt. Now, inversely, nowhere listed in these net assets are listed future tax. In other words, the taxpayer money that's going to come in to pay for these future long-term debts is not listed as an asset. So why are we listing long-term liabilities, which will be paid for by future taxpayer money, as a liability? Why are we doing this? Why are we listing future liabilities without listing the future assets that will pay for those liabilities? Why indeed? Of course, we have our answer it's simply the scam that's put into place to take money, invest that money, and then hide that money by listing future liabilities. When we go to the government funds balance sheet, we come to the fund balances section where it states unreserved. These are the monies that are in these funds that are undesignated and unreserved, meaning that technically they could go to be spent for anything that government chooses, but they don't. They keep them in other funds and hide them from the public. And so instead of paying off the future debt that we just showed, we have $3.4 in the general fund, $6.1 in the building fund, 
for a total in just the governmental, not the non-governmental funds, of $20 million that could go right now to pay off debt. Here's the reconciliation of the governmental funds balance sheet. And here's a look at the long-term obligations at the year end, which consist of general obligation bonds, again, required by law to be in debt through bondage, and the rest is compensated absences, early retirement issues, and other post-employment benefits, totaling over $1 million and a total of $9.4 million on those long-term obligations. Here's revenues and expenditures, what they spend for instruction, instruction-related activities, general administration, etc. And naturally, since this is something that gets reported on the budget report, they're going to show a loss for the year of $1.1 million in these governmental funds, with a total fund balance of $15,220,000. Even though the fund balance is above stated total net assets for government activities in the balance sheet of $20 million. <laughs> so we show a loss of $1 million. Meanwhile, we have $5 million extra dollars stuffed in there where nobody can see it. This is your legal creative accounting coming straight from the California state government and the federal government. Here's your fiduciary funds, and here it states that the liabilities of the assets held are due to student groups. Now, that doesn't mean that the $504,000 that is in these funds is going to go right away to student groups. No. Again, we're talking about an investment fund, so that money is already invested and making a return on its investment until that money gets paid out to the student groups. Under the Summary of Significant Accounting Policies, it states under the financial reporting entity that the Rim of the World Unified School District, the district, was organized on June 21, 1954, under the laws of the state of California. The district operates under a locally elected five-member board form of government and provides educational services to grades kindergarten through 12th as mandated by the state and or federal agencies. It then states that the primary government of the district consists of all funds, departments, boards, and agencies that are not legally separate from the district. Again, a legally separate entity is where they hide the money. For Rim of the World Unified School District, this includes general operations, food service, and student-related activities of the district, which is basically what they report on the budget report. In the basis of presentation, meaning what is selectively presented to the public, under fund accounting, it states that the accounting system is organized and operated on a fund basis. A fund is defined as a fiscal and accounting entity with a self-balancing set of accounts, which are segregated for the purpose of carrying on specific activities or attaining certain objectives in accordance with special regulations, restrictions, or limitations. The district's funds are grouped into two broad fund categories, governmental and fiduciary. All this is saying is that money is transferred into these funds, and then the laws are set into place that require that money to be used for that fund's stated purpose. Governmental funds are those through which most governmental functions typically are financed. Governmental fund reporting focuses on the sources, uses, and balances of current financial resources. Expendable assets are assigned to the various governmental funds according to the purposes for which they may or must, by law, be used. Current liabilities are assigned to the fund from which they will be paid. The difference between governmental fund assets and liabilities is reported as fund balance. So let's go over some of these funds and you'll start to understand why these funds were created in the first place. Instead of having just one generic bank account, we have all these investment funds. Of course, we have the major governmental funds. 
Again, governmental a very important word because that refers to actual taxpayer uses. The general fund is the chief operating fund for all districts. It is used to account for the ordinary operations of a district. All transactions except those required or permitted by law to be in another fund are accounted for in this fund. And again, the only thing that's required to be in other funds is 3% of future operating costs. And there's the cafeteria fund, which is regulated by federal, state, and local resources. For the really crappy food service program that all schools have, very unhealthy, and if I was a parent, I wouldn't allow my children to eat what goes in those sloppy Joe sandwiches. The building fund exists primarily to account separately for proceeds from sale of bonds, acquisition of major governmental capital facilities, and buildings. So again, we put money into these funds specifically for the acquisition of new buildings. Okay, well, guess what? We can put millions of dollars in that fund, invest that money for many years, and never actually use the money until we buy a future building in 5 years, 10 years, 20 years. It just depends on the legislation that's written in government. It's a way of putting money in a fund and simply investing that money and then eventually paying for that future building with the actual money that's in the fund while the investment return from the investments made by that money in the fund go somewhere else. Then you have non-major governmental funds and special revenue funds are funds established to account for the proceeds from specific revenue sources other than trusts or for major capital projects that are restricted to the financing of particular activities. Again, little codes that force these funds to be open. Adult Education Fund, Child Development Fund, Deferred Maintenance Fund. Again, we put money into a fund for future maintenance. We don't use the money that we have to simply pay for current maintenance. We create a fund to pay for future unknown and unconceived maintenance that might happen in the future. Meanwhile, we invest the money. Then there's capital projects funds. Capital project funds are established to account for financial resources to be used for the acquisition or construction of major capital facilities other than those financed by proprietary funds and trust funds. And we have the Capital Facilities Fund, the County School Facilities Fund, and the Special Reserve Fund for Capital Outlay Projects. The word outlay simply means to spend. Then there's Debt Service Funds, and you know we talked about this already, but I cannot get this drilled into your head enough that this fund is specifically set up to fund debt. Debt that is already known about that could be paid off today, but is instead being put into a fund to invest and make money. Meanwhile, the government is paying interest on debt that it already has. So it makes a profit and then charges the debt and the interest to the taxpayer. And all the while reporting that it doesn't have the money to pay the debt. <laughs> Bond Interest and Redemption Fund. The Bond Interest and Redemption Fund is used for the repayment of bonds issued for a district. Again, why the bond isn't just paid off with the money that's in the fund? <laughs> I think we've covered that, but obviously it's so that they can invest that money and make the taxpayers pay for the future debt. And then there's the Tax Override Fund which is used for the repayment of voted indebtedness other than bond interest and redemption fund payments to be financed from tax levies. Jeez, again, <laughs> we're voting to put money into a fund instead of paying off debt. Fiduciary funds. Fiduciary fund reporting focuses on net assets and changes in net assets. The fiduciary fund category is split into four classifications. Pension trust funds, investment trust funds, private purpose trust funds, and agency funds. Now, we covered the agency funds, but perhaps one of the most important aspects of what government does with your taxpayer money are these other fiduciary funds, the pension, investment, and private purpose trust funds. Under the investments section, it states that investments held at June 30th, 2010 with original maturities greater than one year are stated at fair value. Fair value is estimated based on quoted market prices at year end. 
All investments not required to be reported at fair value are stated at cost or amortized cost. Fair values of investments in county and state investment pools, the state commingled funds, are determined by the program sponsor. So again, we see investments that are held as of June 30th with maturity dates that are far greater than one year away where the profit will actually be made are reported at today's fair value. So while we list our future liabilities, we don't list our future assets or profits. By the time these investments mature, the government will be making millions of dollars in profit. But that is not listed as an asset. And the game continues. Under restricted assets, it states that restricted assets arise when restrictions on their use change the normal understanding of the availability of the asset. Such constraints are either imposed by creditors, contributors, grantors, or laws of other governments, or imposed by enabling legislation. <laughs> enabling legislation imposes a lot. Restricted assets in the general fund represent cash and cash equivalents required by grantors to be set aside by the district for the purpose of satisfying certain requirements of the entitlement. Restricted assets in the capital project funds represent cash and equivalents required to be used for approved construction projects. So again, restricted assets simply means that money is put into a specific fund and required to stay there until that project or whatever that fund is designed to pay becomes a liability. It remains an asset until that time and that asset is thus invested. Under compensated absences, it states that sick leave is accumulated without limit for each employee at the rate of one day for each month worked. So the government creates a fund and puts sick leave pay at the rate of 12 days per year into a fund. Whenever an employee takes a sick day, that sick day is then paid out of that fund. But once again, that money is invested until it becomes a liability. Until the day that that employee takes that sick day, that money is invested and makes a profit. Now, very important to understand about this is that the employees do not gain a vested right to accumulate sick leave. Employees are never paid for any sick leave balance at termination of employment or any other time. Therefore, the value of accumulated sick leave is not recognized as a liability in the district's financial statements. What does this mean? It means that employees have no equity in these sick days. If they don't take the sick day, they, they lose that value, that benefit. Government creates these type of incentives, the incentive to call in sick once a month, whereas otherwise people might not ever call in sick unless they absolutely had to. Now there's an incentive to take at least 12 days off a year and say that you're sick. In this way, that money can be put into a fund and invested. Every single thing that government does revolves around this concept. Incentivize, 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 and put the money that's going to pay for that incentive into a fund. The sole purpose of government is to get as much money in these funds as possible so that they can keep investing. These amounts are reported in the fund from which the employees who have accumulated leave are paid. Again, just saying that the money goes into the fund and doesn't get paid out until the sick day arrives on the paycheck. Under the accrued liabilities and long-term obligations sections, we reinforce what we've been talking about here. All payables, accrued liabilities, and long-term obligations are reported in the government-wide financial statements. In general, governmental fund payables and accrued liabilities that, once incurred, are paid in a timely manner and in full from current financial resources are reported as obligations of the funds. 
So the money stays in the fund and gets paid in a timely manner when the long-term obligation, which can be years away, finally gets there. Again, that money could have paid off the debt much sooner and avoided the interest charges that are accrued. But that's not how government works. It's not the law. It's not profitable to do it that way. You profit on both ends, you see, because you're borrowing from yourself. You're bonding the people and borrowing from money you already have. You're making money on both ends as a government. And if not, then it's one of the government-owned corporations that we've talked about in previous productions that are funding your bonds. And so they are making a profit. <laughs> this is organized crime. And it's the most extreme example you will ever see. This is worse than communism, socialism, or any other ism you can possibly think of. However, claims and judgments, compensated absences, special termination benefits, and contractually required pension contributions, again, contractually required pension contributions, that will be paid from governmental funds are reported as a liability in the fund financial statements, only to the extent that they are due for payment during the current year. Could be six months or 12 months away, but they're listed as a liability. The taxpayer money that's going to pay that, not listed as an asset. Bonds, capital leases, and long-term loans are recognized as liabilities in the governmental fund financial statements when due. Bond issuance costs, premiums, and discounts. In the government's wide financial statements, long-term obligations are reported as liabilities in the applicable governmental activities statement of net assets. Bond premiums and discounts, as well as issuance costs, are deferred and amortized over the life of the bonds using the effective interest method. Fund balance reserves and designations. The district reserves those portions of fund balance which are legally segregated for a specific future use or which do not represent available expenditure resources and therefore are not available for appropriation or expenditure. They tell you that these funds cannot be used for anything but what the fund describes. Unreserved fund balance indicates that portion of fund balance which is available for appropriation in future periods. It sits there, not designated for anything. Fund equity reserves have been established for revolving cash accounts, stores, inventories, prepaid expenditures or expenses, and legally restricted grants and entitlements. Designations of fund balances consist of that portion of the fund balance that has been designated or set aside by the governing board to provide for specific purposes or uses. Fund equity designations have been established for economic uncertainties and other purposes. We may have a flood. We may have a fire. We may have an earthquake. We may have a plague, and so we have to save money for that. That's all it's saying. We may have property damage. We may have all kinds of different things. And so we have to keep this money for economic uncertainties. The Federal Reserve may decide to, to retract the money supply and create new deflation or inflation. So we, we better keep money on hand in case any one of a million things happens in the economy. Net assets represent the difference between assets and liabilities. Net assets are reported as restricted when there are limitations imposed on their use, either through the enabling legislation, the law adopted by the district, or through external restrictions imposed by creditors, grantors, or laws or regulations of other governments. Again, laws are changeable at the stroke of a pen. The district first applies restricted resources when an expense is incurred for purposes for which both restricted and unrestricted net assets are available. Enabling legislation relates to laws passed that create a revenue source to be used for specific purposes. The government-wide financial statements report net assets restricted of $2.7 million. Under interfund activity, meaning the amount of money that gets transferred between these funds, 
all the time, it states that exchange transactions between funds are reported as revenues in the seller funds and as expenditures or expenses in the purchaser funds. Again, a credit or a loss, a positive or a negative. Flows of cash or goods from one fund to another without a requirement for repayment are reported as interfund transfers. Well, wait a minute, I thought there was a law against that. I thought that the money that's in one fund had to be paid out to buildings or had to be paid out to pensions or had to be paid out for this. Why are you allowing transfers? Something's fishy here. The truth is that transfers happen all the time. And the laws and legal codes that are quoted every time you ask why these funds aren't being used to pay off the debt are only used when it's convenient for government. Under estimates, it states the preparation of the financial statements in conformity with the accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America requires management to make estimates and assumptions that affect the amounts reported in the financial statements and accompanying notes. Actual results may differ from those estimates. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. You know, again, you have a checking account. You have money coming in. You have money going out. It should be that simple. That's what government should be. But instead, they, <laughs> they need statements like this and, and fund balances and investments and all this stuff. All government needs to be is one checking account. That's it. That's all you would need if you had an ideal government, an honest government, and one that wasn't interested in completely screwing the public. Now, it's always my hope that I can get through to people about this and really make them understand that there is no such thing as property ownership. Under property tax, it states that secured property taxes attach as an enforceable lien on property as of January 1st. So government puts a lien on your property, on your home, on any property that you have to secure debt. This means technically, that you do not own property, and that if you do not pay your protection money, your property tax, the government can take your property. Because in all reality, you've registered and given that property to government. And this is why it can secure your property with property tax. Taxes are payable in two installments on November 1st and February 1st. Oh, that's so nice of them to split it up like that. And become delinquent on December 10th and April 10th, respectively. Oh, wait, they just lost their niceness. Unsecured property taxes are payable in one installment on or before August 31st. The County of San Bernardino bills and collects the taxes on behalf of the district. Local property tax revenues are recorded when received. You know, it's so nice of the county to be so gracious and collect and put people into collections for their property taxes and to do that on behalf of the district. It's as if they're acting altruistically. It's so sweet of them to do that and, and to put a lien on everybody's home and then take their property. I, I don't know what it takes to get people to see that they are slaves to this government. They are not in any way a free people. They are not in any way, you are not in any way a property owner. There's no such thing as property ownership if you have to then pay a tax and if you don't pay a tax that your property can be taken. For God's sake, the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States states very clearly that government can take your land with due process of law and with just compensation. This is the very basis of eminent domain from this document that we're supposed to worship as if the Fifth Amendment is a right. When something like this is passed off as a right of the people, where it states specifically that your life, liberty, and property can and will be taken by the government with due process of law, that is not a right because you have no legal recourse to say no. Therefore, the only conclusion we can come to is that there is no such thing as property ownership. Here's note two listing deposits and investments 
where it states that government activities generated $14.6 million, and there is listed the fiduciary funds. Also, cash in hand and in banks, cash in revolving instruments, and investments for total deposits and investments of $15.1 million. And then it states under the policies and practices... The district is authorized under California Government Code to make direct investments in local agency bonds, notes, or warrants within the state. U.S. Treasury instruments, registered state warrants or treasury notes, securities of the U.S. government or its agencies, bankers' acceptances, commercial paper, certificates of deposit placed with commercial banks and or savings and loan companies, repurchase or reverse purchase agreements, Medium-term corporate notes, shares of beneficial interest issued by diversified management companies, certificates of participation, obligations with first priority security, and collateralized mortgage obligations. Obligations with first priority security simply means that they become the first lien holder on your property. And now, again, I can't emphasize enough that you understand that this district is required to do these things by state and county law. Here it states, under investment in county treasury, the district is considered to be an involuntary participant in an external investment pool as the district is required to deposit all receipts and collections of monies with their county treasurer. So when we talk about these things, oftentimes it's not even up to the district. It is the state or federal law that these districts and other local governments participate in this fraud, in this organized crime. The fair value of the district's investment in the pool is reported in the accounting financial statements at amounts based upon the district's pro rata share of the fair value provided by the county treasurer for the entire portfolio in relation to the amortized cost of that portfolio. The balance available for withdrawal is based on the accounting records maintained by the county treasurer, which is recorded on the amortized cost basis. And here's another look at what this special district and other governments actually invest in. Bonds, notes, warrants, U.S. Treasury obligations, bankers' acceptance, etc. It's also very important to understand that these investments are in no way safe investments. Here in the county treasurer investment pool, which is that state commingled fund we talked about, we have a fair value of $14,353,000. And it states that interest rate risk is the risk that changes in market interest rates will adversely affect the fair value of an investment. Generally, the longer the maturity of an investment, the greater the sensitivity of its fair value to changes in market interest rates. The district manages its exposure to interest rate risk by investing in the county pool to provide the cash flow and liquidity needed for operations. Information about the sensitivity of fair values of the district investments to market interest rate fluctuation is provided by the following schedule that shows the distribution of the district's investment by maturity. There you go, 334 days left to maturity. During which time, that money is in complete risk. Here's why. Under credit risk, it states credit risk is the risk that an insurer of an investment will not fulfill its obligation to the holder of the investment. This is measured by the assignment of a rating by a nationally recognized statistical rating organization. The district's investment with the San Bernardino County Investment Pool is rated AAA by Moody's Investor Services. The custodial risk is the risk that in an event of a bank failure, the district's deposits may not be returned to it. What? So you're telling me that these governments are investing money into banks that could close and take all their money? The district does not have a policy for custodial credit risk for deposits. However... The California Government Code requires that a financial institution secure deposits made by the state or local government units by pledging securities in an undivided collateral pool held by a depository regulated under state law 
unless so waived by the government unit. So I hate to tell you this, but here you have a case where the banks are also using your mortgages to secure the custodial credit risks. <laughs> so your property is being double tapped and used as collateral in many different ways. As of June 30th, 2010, the district's bank balance of $402,000 was exposed to custodial risk because it was uninsured and collateralized with securities held by the Pledging Financial Institutions Trust Department or agent, but not in the name of the district. Huh. So again, completely uninsured investments going on here. And remember, if the district loses this money because of this custodial credit risk, it does not mean that the money disappears into the ether. It means that someone is going to be getting $402,000 as a profit. There's always two sides to every transaction. So money is never lost in these situations. When your retirement fund or your investment portfolio goes down in value by 50%, Someone else's is going up. Someone is pocketing that money on the other side of the trade or the other side of the investment. California law also allows financial institutions to secure public deposits by pledging first trust deed mortgage notes having a value of 150% of the secured public deposits and letter of credit issued by the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, having a value of 105% of the secured deposits. Again, using your mortgages without your knowledge or even consent, although you consent by signing the mortgage, the bank owns your home at that point, which means the government owns your home. Your mortgage, your home, is being used as collateral for all of this stuff that government is investing in. And again, it is being used for many different forms of securing and collateralizing debt. Under note three in receivables, we see here again that the lottery contributed $310,000 to this school district. <laughs> How wonderful is that? Thank goodness we have the lottery to supplement the school district. I don't know what we'd do without gambling. Under note five, we come to the interfund transactions we talked about earlier, where we see all kinds of money being moved around on a constant basis. Again, the bending or breaking of rules is happening on a constant basis. The laws are only set in place to protect and to use at the government's convenience to tell you that it can't use this money for any other purpose. And here it states that Interfund transfers are actually used to use unrestricted revenues collected in the general fund to finance various programs accounted for in other funds in accordance with budgetary authorizations. In other words, they can use those unrestricted funds for whatever they want to, as long as they themselves authorize it. <laughs> this is like setting rules for yourself. And then in the midst of bankruptcy, knowing that you could use this money to get yourself out of bankruptcy, you say, well, no, I'm going to keep that money there and lose everything because I set my own rule, which at any time I can change <laughs> to save myself. It doesn't make sense. When the very entities that are stealing money and investing money like this are setting their own rules, that's how you know it's organized crime. Here's note six, which lists the accounts payable. And then to note eight, which is long-term obligations, which since 2009 have increased by over $400,000. We see those general obligation bonds of $7.6 million, which have increased because of the interest that's being charged on those bonds. And we see the retirement incentive program, of which this district is paying $498,000 of taxpayer money. Down at the bottom, we see bonded debt. Again, required by law. Date issued, 6-10-2009. The maturity date is 8-1-2033. The interest rate is a variable rate from 1.2 to 6.9%. 
Note here that the accreted value is $17,297. The word accretion simply means an increase by natural growth or by gradual external addition growth in size or extent. So it's just the amount of debt that's being accrued for this short period of time, which adds to the bonds outstanding as of June 30th, 2010 at 7,617,000 instead of just 7,600,000. On the next section, it talks about the obligation bonds and lists them until maturity in 2034. For 2008 General Obligation Bonds Series A, it states that in June 2009, the district issued 7.3 million in current interest bonds and 300,000 in capital appreciation bonds with an original premium of $517.9,000 and a cost of issuance of 295000 The bonds were issued to renovate, repair, construct, and equip certain district schools, sites, and facilities. The bonds mature on August 1st, 2033, with interest yields from 1.2 to 6.9%. At June 30th, 2010, the principal balance outstanding was, as we saw, $7,617,000, unamortized premium received and cost of issuance of the bonds as of June 30th, 2010 were 496000 and 238000 respectively. Issuance costs and the premium are amortized over the life of the bonds as a component of interest expense on the bonds. What does this mean? Well, let's just look at the graph here. We can see that the principal amount of the bonds as of 2009 is 7.6 million, but when we add all of the accreted or added to interest by the end of 2034, we're going to have a total interest of almost double. So by the time these bonds mature, and the school district, or the taxpayers, I should say, finally pay these off, they're going to pay more than double what the actual original cost of it was, at $14.4 million. And so, again, if the school district were to pay off all of its debt today, as mentioned in the beginning of this CAFR, they'd still have $61 million left over. But here we see that instead of doing that, we're going to take out a $7.3 million loan in the form of an interest bond. And then we're going to wait to pay that bond off so that the district and the taxpayers pay an extra $7 million in interest. As stated earlier, the district could pay off all debt today and still have $61 million in assets left over. You know, we, we could ask why is it set up this way, but obviously that money is being invested. It is a way for one government agency to borrow from another government agency or bank or anything else and make a profit in a mutually beneficial arrangement. And then, of course, government requires these types of transactions so that it can keep the organized crime business in action. Under the Retirement Incentive Program, it states that the district has a Retirement Incentive Program whereby the district pays 25% of the eligible early retirees minimum of 55 years of age with 10 years of service. It pays 25% of the eligible early retirees final year's salary in three equal annual payments commencing after the employee's retirement. The future liability to the district for this program is estimated to be almost $500,000. Now again, does it make sense to you to give an incentive to a government employee to retire early and pay the final year's salary in three equal annual payments? And then, of course, they live the rest of their life on the pension system, for which is taking trillions out of the taxpayer base every year. Why would taxpayers wish for this type of government ridiculousness to continue? Why would you offer your government workers early retirement? There is no good reason for this type of wasteful spending. You have to work until you're a certain age if you're not a government employee. 
So why should you then pay for them to retire early? The truth of the matter is that if you're a government employee, you're going to defend this to the grave. You're going to defend the pension system to your grave because you're part of the system that enslaves everyone else, even though it enslaves you too. How do you fight against that? Under other post-employment benefits, it states that the district's annual required contribution for the year ended June 30th, 2010 was $768,619 and contributions made by the district during the year were $489,833. Interest on the net OPEB obligation and adjustments to the annual required contribution were 17 and 23,000 respectively, which resulted in an increase to the net OPEB benefit obligation of $273,000. As of June 30th, 2010, the net benefit obligation was $628,000. Again, why are we not using the money that we have to pay off that obligation? We know that this district would have $61 million in assets left over, of which over $7 million is liquid assets if they paid off all debt, this debt included. So why purposefully create debt? Well, I think we've answered that question good enough, and so we'll move on. But I would very much like you to take note that this is the taxpayer contribution to these pension funds, not the employee contribution. The employees are separate. That is paid out of their paychecks. They voluntarily contribute and are forced to contribute, in some cases, that money to the pension system. What we're talking about here is the taxpayer money that is contributed for what the district says is on behalf of the employee but again the employee has absolutely no equity in that money seven hundred and sixty eight thousand dollars of taxpayer money for just this school district is being contributed to the pension system taxpayer money that is completely different than the employee contributions the pension fund scheme is responsible for many, many, many trillions of dollars worldwide. This money is invested in every major corporation that you can think of. Again, for more information on the Great Pension Fund hoax, watch the Great Pension Fund hoax linked below. Under Note 11, Post-Employment Health Care Plan and Other Post-Employment Benefits, another social program, it states that the plan provides medical and dental insurance benefits to eligible retirees and their spouses. Membership of the plan consists of 64 retirees and beneficiaries currently receiving benefits and 459 active plan members. Under the Contribution Information, it states that the contribution requirements of plan members and of the district are established and may be amended by the district and the Teachers Association, the CEA, and the local California Service Employees Association, the CSEA. The required contribution is based on projected pay-as-you-go financing requirements. For fiscal year 2009 and 2010, the district contributed $489,000 to the plan, all of which was used for current premiums. Again, that's taxpayer money. The contribution requirements of plan members and the district are two separate things. Listed here is the district contribution. When you see a government contributing to something, that is taxpayer money. Again listed, the annual OPEB costs and net OPEB obligations for these pension funds. And the expense is calculated based on the annual required contribution of the employer. Again, the taxpayer, not the employee contribution. An amount actuarially determined in accordance with the perimeters of Government Accounting Standards Board. GASB statement number 45. The ARC represents a level of funding that, if paid on an ongoing basis, is projected to cover normal cost each year and amortize the unfunded actuarial accrued liabilities, UAAL, or funding excess over a period not to exceed 30 years. Again, why are we 
purposefully not paying the full amount of these pension funds. When we have assets to burn, it doesn't make sense unless you want to purposefully be in debt, which is what government wants. The following table shows the components of the district's annual cost for each year, the amount actually contributed to the plan, and the changes in the district's net OPEB obligation to the plan. So again, every year, $768,000 of taxpayer money, not employee money, has to go to this plan. Each year, they're not giving enough money. In this case, 489000 of that was actually paid, which increased the obligation by 273000 meaning that now that obligation is up to $628,000, which could be paid off by current assets. But, hey, I'm just saying, it would just be logical. I don't know. Under Note 12 in Risk Management... It states that the district participates in three public entity risk pools, and again, these are investment funds or pools, JPAs, for the health and welfare and workers' compensation programs and purchases property and liability coverage through the JPAs. JPA simply stands for a Joint Powers Authority. Refer to Note 15 for additional information regarding the JPAs. For insured programs, there have been no significant reductions in insurance coverage. Settlement amounts have not exceeded insurance coverage for the current year or the three prior years. Now, the most important part about these risk management pools, these joint powers associations that are created specifically to pay for lawsuits, is that the government is requiring taxpayer money to be put into these pools, into these fund accounts. It is then invested and so then, of course, any time a taxpayer then sues the county, the city, the state, or the school district, that government then just goes to this insurance pool and pays for that claim. So the local governments, the state governments, and the federal governments who all participate in these risk management funds, these pooled investment funds, allows these governments to basically be off the hook for any and all lawsuits. And then you add to the equation that government specifically sets laws that says that a taxpayer can only sue the city, the district, or whatever government they're suing for a certain amount of money. Whether that amount of money actually pays for the loss or damages to that person doesn't matter. You see, it's law that you can only sue government for so much, and when government loses, it simply takes the taxpayer-funded pool and pays the person or corporation that's suing the government. So, really, this completely puts the government off the hook for any and all lawsuits. And it means that they're taking your taxpayer money and paying you with it. It also means that when they eminent domain your property, they have a pooled investment fund for that. And they're paying you with your own taxpayer money when they steal your property through eminent domain. Again, this is how you know you're a debt slave who does not own property. Under note 13, the employee retirement systems, it states that qualified employees are covered under multiple employer retirement plans maintained by agencies of the state of California. Certified employees are members of the California State Teachers Retirement System, or CalSTRS, and classified employees are members of the California Public Employees Retirement System, or CalPERS. CalPERS being a multi-billion offshore corporation at this point. Now, for CalSTRS, benefit provisions are established by state statutes as legislatively amended within the state teacher's retirement law. CalSTRS issues a separate comprehensive annual financial report because it is a separate entity of government. It is, in fact, a government that has its own CAFR, and it includes financial statements and required supplementary information, just like the CAFR we're looking at. Copies of CalSTRS annual financial report may be obtained from CalSTRS on Folsom Boulevard in Sacramento, California. Under the funding policy, it states that active plan members are required, required to contribute 8% of their salary, and the district is required to contribute an actuarially determined rate. Again, the separation of employee money and taxpayer money. The actuarial methods and assumptions used for determining the rate 
are those adopted by Calster's Teachers Retirement Board, a whole other board of directors for a whole different government. The required employer contribution rate for fiscal year 2009 through 2010 was 8.25% of annual payroll. The contribution requirements of the plan members are established by state statute. Now again here it says the required employer contribution rate, not employee. Anytime you see the word employer in government, that means taxpayer money. So the required taxpayer contribution. This is where the majority of government money goes. The district's contributions to CalSTRS for the fiscal years ending June 30th, 2010, 2009, and 2008 were $1.3 million, $1.4 million, and $1.45 million, respectively, and equal 100% of the required contributions for each year. So almost a million and a half of your taxpayer money in this district is going to fund the pension system. Also, we have the California Public Employees Retirement System for which this district is contributing to. If you're not a teacher, then you get to go into this plan. It states that the district contributes to the school employer pool under CalPERS. Benefit provisions are established by state statutes as legislatively amended within the public employees' retirement laws. Again, employees are required to fund this system, which is a massive, massive investment fund, the largest in the United States. Under its funding policy, it states that active plan members are required to contribute 7% of their salary, and the district is required to contribute an actuarially determined rate. The actuarial methods and assumptions used for determining the rate are those adopted by the CalPERS Board of Administration, a completely separate board for a completely separate government, also required to have a comprehensive annual financial report. The required employer contribution rate for fiscal year 2009 and 10 was 9.7% of covered payroll. This is about 40% more money than employees actually put into their pension fund. The contribution requirements of the plan members are established by state statute. The district's contributions to CalPERS for the fiscal years ended June 30th, 2010, 2009, and 2008 were 587,585,000 dollars and $594,000 respectively, and equal 100% of the required contributions for each year. So we can add another $587,000, bringing our total pension costs to over $2.5 million just for the taxpayers of the Rim of the World School District. But let's not forget the ultimate pension fund for every single person who is a citizen of the United States called the Social Security Fund. The Social Security Fund, as of 2010, had over $2.5 trillion in its investment fund, of which nobody seems to know even exists. As established by federal law, all public sector employees who are not members of their employer's existing retirement system, CalSTRS or CalPERS, must be covered by Social Security or an alternative plan. The district has elected to use Social Security as its alternative plan. Now, I don't think most people have stopped to consider that the Social Security Fund is, in fact, a pension fund for all the people in the United States. But that's exactly what it is. And like any investment fund scheme, it is taking in money, investing that money, making a humongous profit off of that money, using that investment capital to purchase the corporate structure and real estate of the world, and then paying out a few measly benefits here and there. Again, taxpayers are required to contribute to this national pension fund called the Social Security System. And then there's on behalf payments. The state of California makes contributions to CalSTRS on behalf of the district. So now we've got the state government involved, taking everybody in the state's taxpayer money and making these contributions on behalf of the district. These payments consist of state general fund contributions to CalSTRS in the amount of $684,000, 4.267% of annual payroll. 
So for every school district in the nation, you've got states now contributing other taxpayer money specifically to the pension system. That money is taxpayer money and it is not eligible for withdrawal from any employee or from any of the taxpayer base. Once it is contributed or given to the fund, it is lost in the ether. It is invested and never seen again by the taxpayer. Under accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America, these amounts are to be reported as revenues and expenditures. Accordingly, these amounts have been recorded in these financial statements. On behalf payments have been excluded from the calculation of available reserves and have not been included in the budget amounts reported to the general fund budgetary comparison schedule. When you see the state the federal government and other agencies of government giving money or grants to the school districts and to other governments, both local and state, you can pretty much figure out that that money is going to be given back to government in some way or the other, whether it is contributed to the pension fund or paid through other federal taxes. Letter note 14, commitments and contingencies, and under grants, it states that the district received financial assistance from federal and state agencies in the form of grants. The disbursement of funds received under these programs generally requires compliance with terms and conditions specified in the grant agreements and are subject to audit by the grantor agencies. Any disallowed claims resulting from such audits could become a liability of the general fund or other applicable funds. However, in the opinion of management, any such disallowed claims will not have a material adverse effect on the overall financial position of the district at June 30th, 2010. This is basically how the federal government has gotten its claws into every local, county, and state government around. All the districts and everything else are forced to comply with federal rules in order to get this extra money. And of course, that money must be used for federal purposes. In other words, that money comes with rules. And oftentimes, that money goes right back out into the pension system, which then supports the federal government. What we have is a completely collaborative and collective criminal circuit. Under litigation, it states that the district is involved in various litigation arising from the normal course of business. In the opinion of management and legal counsel, the disposition of all litigation pending is not expected to have a material adverse effect on the overall financial position of the district. And that, of course, is because they're involved in the risk management fund, the pooled investment funds that cover such litigation. Now, it's interesting to note here under the construction commitments of this school district, we see unfinished capital projects. We have Rim High School roofing projects and several other roofing projects ranging from $250,000 to over $1.2 million for a roofing project. Perhaps most insulting to the taxpayer base is the Valley of Enchantment Elementary School sound system costing $105,000. That must be a heck of a sound system. And finally, the government is creating its own fueling station, probably for its buses, and it's going to cost the taxpayers $840,000 to accomplish this feat for total existing contracts as capital projects of $4.1 million. 105000 for a sound system, man. Note 15, participation in public entity risk pools. Uh, here we go again. The district is a member of the Southern California Schools Risk Management and Southern California Schools Employee Benefit Association public entity risk pools. The district pays a monthly premium to each entity for its health and workers' compensation coverage and the annual premium for its property liability coverage. The relationships between the district and the entities are such that they are not component units of the district for financial reporting purposes. In other words, they have their own comprehensive annual financial reports as well. These entities have budgeting and financial reporting requirements independent of member units and their financial statements are not presented in these financial statements. 
However, fund transactions between the entities and the district are included in these statements. Audited financial statements are available from the respected entities. During the year ended June 30th, 2010, the district made payments of a little over $6 million to these joint power authorities for the above-mentioned services. $6 million of taxpayer money went for insurance. I don't know if you caught the significance of that, but $6 million to insurance to a joint powers authority. When we pull up the Southern California Schools Joint Powers Authority, we see Southern California Schools Risk Management. And we could go as far as pulling up their CAFR and seeing all of the money that they have, but just know that the SCSRM is among California's oldest school joint powers authorities. It is a not-for-profit agency serving public schools by managing risk exposures. We provide self-funded and owner-controlled insurance programs for general liability, property coverage, workers' compensation benefits, and construction and commercial insurance. The SCSRM maintains rates for school districts and community colleges, reinvests in managed risk exposure reduction, helps manage cash flow, and develops strategies with our insurance partners for our members. They offer automobile liability and comprehensive collision, boiler and machinery, crime, and general liability. And of course, there's 32 of the 58 or so school districts in California participating in this fund. So you can imagine if each school district is contributing over $6 million to this fund, that's going to have a lot of money. Here's a list of the member entities of Southern California Schools Risk Management. And there's Rim of the World. Under Note 16, the fiscal issues relating to budget reductions... The state of California continues to suffer the effects of a recessionary economy. Well, they should make more gambling opportunities. California school districts are reliant on the state of California to appropriate the funding necessary to continue the level of educational services, which are crap, by the way, expected by the state constituency. With the implementation of Education Trailer Bill, Senate Bill 16 of the 2009-2010 Fourth Extraordinary Session, 25% of the current year appropriations have now been deferred to a subsequent period, creating significant cash flow management issues for districts in addition to requiring substantial budget reductions, ultimately impacting the ability of California school districts to meet their goals for educational services. So your taxpayer money is being deferred. And now we come to the required supplementary information. And we see the governing board, the president, clerk, and the members, superintendent, director of personal services. Then we see that this district comprises an area approximately 110 square miles wide. The district operates five elementary schools, one intermediate school, one high school, one continuation high school, an independent study school, and an adult education program. There were no boundary changes during the year. So $6 million in insurance, $2.5 million in pension plan servicing with taxpayer money, all going towards 120 square miles with eight schools. That seems like a lot to me. And here we see the actual amount of children attending these schools, with the average daily attendance being only 4,247 children. Again, we're talking about a whole lot of money to run a school district for only 4,247 children. Under the supplementary information, we start to see some more of the governmental funds, in this case, non-major governmental funds. And we see the Adult Education Fund, Child Development Fund, Deferred Maintenance Fund for total non-major governmental funds at $2.5 million. And once again, we see the Independent Auditor's Report on compliance with requirements that could have a direct or material effect on each major program. Now, what I want you to really take note of here is this paragraph, because this says it all. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report is certainly not meant for public consumption, though it is available for you and anyone to read. As you can see, it's very difficult to actually cut through these figures. 
It states here that this report is intended solely for the information and use of the governing board, management, the California Department of Education, and the State Controller's Office, federal awarding agencies, and pass-through entities, and is not intended to be and should not be used by anyone other than these specified parties. Wasn't that interesting? I thought this was supposed to be a public entity. Why would you not want the public to see this? Perhaps it's because we found so much money <laughs> being wasted or hidden from the public. And finally, we get to the building fund, which is measure W. Apparently, the school is not telling people what's going on with this fund, at least in a public way. But in the CAFR, we see that the fund balance at the end of 2010 was $6.1 million. Note here that under the revenues section, this money is invested because it is receiving interest at $102,000. The district is authorized under California government code to make direct investments in local agency bonds, notes, or warrants within the state. And we've covered this before. Basically, it's saying that Measure W funds can be invested just like all of the other funds in government. And once again, we see that the district, the rim of the world school district, is considered to be an involuntary participant in an external investment pool. Again, we've read this before, and it puts the money into the county treasurer. The district manages its exposure to interest rate risk by investing in the county investment pool. The district maintains a building fund investment of over $7 million with the San Bernardino County Investment Pool. The fair value of this investment is approximately $7,070,000 with an average maturity of 334 days. And that actually brings us to the end of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. There are a few more board agenda items regarding Measure W. It states that the Board of Trustees reached a consensus that $5.2 million of Measure W funds were to be allocated for projects at Rim High, Valley of Enchantment Elementary, and Mary Putnam Hench Intermediate Schools, depending on the availability of funds. And these funds are funded by Measure W. And here we see that the district desires to participate in the STRS Reduced Workload Program. This program allows eligible state teachers retirement system members to reduce their workload and receive a full year of service credit. What? They're going to reduce their workload and in return receive a full year of service credit? Well, who would say no to that, really? How is that in any way helping the taxpayer? So what happens? The district agrees to pay for a full year of service to the state teacher's retirement system and the benefits. Okay, so actually, this money is not necessarily going to the teacher. It's going to the pension fund. This program will allow certified employees to reduce their work year for the 2011-2012 school year. Again, this is an incentive to work less and get rewarded for it. It is also a way to increase the contribution, the money that's taken out of the taxpayer money and put into the pension fund system, never to be seen again. Why would any rational taxpayer say, oh yeah, that's great, we're happy. Yeah, yeah, don't work as much. Yeah, by all means, we'll pay your pension. We'll pay for a full year of service. Don't work so much, teacher. I mean, <laughs> why would we want you to work? and get paid that 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 goes against american uh, values right i mean that's uh yeah well that brings us to the end of the rim of the world school district's comprehensive annual financial report and to the end of this movie now this presentation is designed to give taxpayers an overall comprehension of what is actually going on in government again we see the tip of the iceberg, but now you know that underneath that small portion of the iceberg is a massive, massive investment portfolio scheme that no one seems to understand, comprehend, or even know about. I hope that I've changed that for you today, and I hope that the next time that you actually participate in government, that you call these board members out at their little meetings that they have, where they think that you have no idea of what they're doing behind your backs.
I hope that you go in there, you bring a copy of this comprehensive annual financial report, you throw it down on that podium, and you have your way. Well, verbally anyway, with those darn council members, because they're in on this. Some might have a puzzled look on their face because they are, again, what we refer to as useful innocents. But rest assured that someone in that room is going to know what the heck you're talking about, and they're going to get nervous. They're going to get really nervous that someone in that room can finally see that they are the Mafia. They are the organized crime syndicate that calls themselves the government. And if your council members look at you like you're crazy and say that they have no idea what you're talking about, here's another board agenda item that you can refer to. A topic, the audit report or the comprehensive annual financial report from Jenny Haberlin, the director of business services for the district, where the board is approving Vavrinik Trine, Day, and Company to provide a report on the findings for the 2009-2010 audit conducted for Rim of the World Unified School District. It states right here, which means they must know that Education Code Section 41020 requires each school district in the state to contract with a public accountant or certified public accountant for an audit of the district's financial records and of the district's compliance with state and federal guidelines. And it states that our audit, meaning the board of the district, our audit for the 2009-2010 fiscal year is complete. These guys know about it, so don't let them tell you otherwise. With that, I bid you farewell and invite you again to go to thecorporationnation.com and view my other documentaries on the Kaffir situation. Also, I've written other Kaffir school articles, which are posted on my blog at realityblogger.wordpress.com. I'll put a link for this Kaffir that I've been reading from down at the bottom, as well as the links to my other movies. Once again, I thank you and remind you that this scheme is happening all across the country in every government agency out there. And only you, and you alone, can make a difference by standing up and saying to these people that you understand, that you comprehend, and that the gig is up. Thank you very much, and good luck.